Um, our scripture reading is taken from two places. Um, Proverbs 29, 18, and the book of Habakkuk, um, chapter 2. So you're going to have to be multi-talented here and have a finger in one and a finger in the other. Um, Proverbs is easy to find. It's right after Psalms. Habakkuk, look at the number in the, in the uh, bulletin and turn to that page. <clears throat> It's one of those small books that's in the Minor Prophets, and uh, you just kind of thumb through and say, oh, there it is. <laughs> but we'll start with uh, reading the verse from Proverbs 29 first. Proverbs 29:18 says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. And then Habakkuk chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 2 and 3. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets, so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. And Lord, we ask that you would speak to us out of these two verses, the wisdom of Proverbs, and Lord, the reply you made to the prophet Habakkuk. And Lord, help us to see how they apply to us today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As Timber so very well um, summarized, the, the seminar that we had with uh, John Kimball, and it was uh, um, a lot of teaching, but also a lot of interaction that we had with him. And the first week dealt with our core values, who we are as a church. And it answers the question, what about us most reflects Jesus? And, you know, that's hard to do. It's hard to look at ourselves as a church and say, you know, what are the things that we value the most? And we spent a week looking at that, and, uh, and we really came up with some of the values that dealt with integrity and authenticity. We have a strong value of relationships and valuing relationships with one another and, and caring about people and not letting anyone uh, kind of wander off course. And, uh, and so we talked about some of those things. And then the second week, we talked about vision. Values and vision are two things that become set like foundation stones uh, in the life of a church. And, uh, and the values, you know, those are not something that we say, gee, let, let me choose what, what I want. No, they are how we live. They are who we are. But a vision is a picture of God's prefer, preferred future for us. What does God have in store for us? It really answers the question of what is God doing and how does he want us to join with him in his mission in this area? And, uh, and uh, John Kimball left us with a challenge, as, as uh, Timber shared, that, that we, um, over the next two, three, four weeks, are to really seek the Lord in terms of his vision for us. Now, I know that there's been a lot of talk about... Um, you know, vision, companies have vision statements and churches now have vision statements. And the past couple of decades, there's been a lot of talk about vision. You know, and we, if we have a vision, then we're going someplace. Well, vision's important because if you want to go to Boston, you know, you need to say, well, okay, what direction do I need to head? Well, when you start out, you say, well, let's head north. Eventually, you have to get a little bit more specific. What route are we going to take and how are we going to go there and what part of Boston do we want to go to? And so 
a vision really looks forward to the destination that we want to we want to end up or where we want to be several years from now. Um, visions, uh, when God gives a vision like He did, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, you know, and you say, "Well, that's the vision. We're heading to Boston." It is good every so often to say, "Okay, Lord." Let's refine that a bit. Okay, Lord, you know, what mid-course corrections do you want to bring? What other parts of that are, do we need to see? What is the, uh, you know, the aspect of the vision that we need to understand and we seek the Lord rather than, yeah, well, he said that, you know, a decade ago, and we're just going to keep on going. You know, it's important to do that. And, and so we've been challenged to say, let's really seek the Lord in prayer, um, you know, Individually, as we're praying at home, um, corporately, we've kind of said, you know, beginning part of our Bible study, the men and women are going to be together, and we're just going to simply pray and share and talk about what God has been, what do we sense God has been saying. Um, <clears throat> and so this idea of vision, you know, it's not something where, you know, God is going to give us something, in, you know, entirely different, and we've never thought of that before. But rather, it's going to be consistent. It's going to be in keeping. And we're going to look at that, and we're going to go, yeah, it seems good to the Lord and to us. And there's, that, there's going to be that sense of, man, yeah, I knew that. That's just right. Oftentimes, in the business world, the vision comes down from the CEO, from the leader who comes in, and they said, I've got a vision for this company, and this is what it is, and everyone underneath that has to kind of buy into the vision. You know, in, in the Christian world, in the church, and you know, the church is not an organization. We are the church. It's the body of Christ. In the church, the visionary is Jesus. And my job is not to simply declare the vision, and you guys got to say, well, I guess we just have to buy in. But we get to seek the Lord together for his vision for us. My job as a leader is to be certain that we stay on course with what God has for us. And, you know, that's exciting. I'm excited to hear what God is going to share through each one of you. And uh, so don't just simply say, well, that's the pastor's job. We're just going to passively wait for him to declare the vision. No, we're in it together. It's God's vision for us. You know, if men come up with the vision, then you know, all you have is human wisdom. But if we're seeking God, then our job is to receive his vision from him. You know, as we look at the verses, we look at Habakkuk chapter 2, and I, I just chose these two verses. They seem to be kind of random, but they aren't. In Habakkuk, the prophet is struggling, having a conversation with God. And he's struggling with understanding God's vision for the future of Jerusalem and, and the, the, the whole ministry of Israel. And he's looking at Jerusalem and Judea and he's lamenting the sinful state that God's people are in. And this is just before the time in history, uh, you know, 5th century, 6th century B.C., just before Israel is conquered by the Babylonians and, uh, and Jerusalem is destroyed and people are deported to, to Babylon. And Habakkuk is struggling with the sin but also the answer that God is bringing that says, I'm going to bring the Babylonians and they're going to be my answer to the sin of Israel. And Habakkuk is like, how can you do that? They're an ungodly nation. You can't allow your people, we can't allow Jerusalem to be conquered by those ungodly people and Habakkuk struggling with that. And so he, he brings his his struggle before the Lord and said, Lord, is this really you? Is this what you're saying? And God's reply is, write down the revelation and make it plain so that heralds can run with it. 
Now, in some versions of the Bible, it says write down the vision. But here, vision is not just simply someone's idea or someone's great plans that they want God to accomplish. It's really a revelation of God's plans for the future. So when we talk about vision, it really is an a unveiling, a revealing of what God has for us. And for Habakkuk, he was looking and God says, I have already revealed to you what I'm going to do. Write it down, make it plain, so that those who are to announce it to Israel will have a clear message to bring and they can run with it. That was, that's the context of these verses. He says, the revelation is for an appointed time. In other words, God has a timetable. It's specific. And he says, um, it speaks of the end. Or I look at that, it says it speaks about what God wants to accomplish. And he says, though it linger, though it wait, don't lose heart. Hold on to the revelation that God gives and, uh, and it will come to pass. You know, when God speaks something, we know that we can trust in him bringing it about. Pastor Ed or I were declaring something that we want, and we say, I really think this is going to happen in the future. They say, I hope he's right, but I don't know. But if God says something, right, that's different. That's really different. We can take that to the bank. When God speaks, we can say, God has, and I, you know that you know that you know that God has spoken that, that we can hold on to that. That's revelation. And God tells Habakkuk, make the revelation clear. Write it down so that the heralds can run with it. What's a herald? Someone who announces good news. You know, if I said, you know, I said to Timber, hey, Timber, uh, you're going to go seeing so-and-so. When you go there, can you give him a message? Timber is now a herald. Jesus says to every single one of us, I have a message. It's the gospel. It's the fact that in Christ, we can be reconciled to the Father, have our sins forgiven. We receive the message, but we also become heralds that you get to bring that message to the people that God points out for you to bring it to. Now, if you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the gospel is true, and when you share that with someone else, when you share the revelation of that, what God says, and they say, well, do you mean if I give my life to Christ, my sins are forgiven? There's no doubt in our minds because it's happened to us. And we can make it plain, we can run with it. And when God gives a revelation of his future for us as a church, and we may be looking out two or three years and we, we're asking the question, Lord, what, where will we be? What will we look like? What will our ministry look like in two or three years? Lord, I can't predict that, but Lord, you can reveal that. And when he begins to reveal that, we can run with that. Even though it may look like we're going in the opposite direction, we say, but the Lord said what the Lord said. Proverbs chapter 29. Let's take a look at that. This is another verse that is usually brought out and, and talked about when vision's talking about and... and um, and uh, in some of the older translations, this is where there is no vision. You know, um, people um, cast off restraint. But again, the word is revelation. Where there is no revelation of God's uh, understanding of our future, then the people, God's people, begin to cast off restraint. Now, we talked about what revelation is. It's an understanding of what God has, what he is doing, and where he's called to participate with him. But what does it mean to cast off restraint? Think about that for a minute. People have no reason to harness their lives to anything. 
They cast off, they become complacent. They say, eh, it doesn't really matter how I live. It doesn't really matter uh, how I pray. Um, it's like the people who are saying, I'm in, I'm saved. I've given my life to Jesus. I'm going to heaven, so I can coast. Where there is no revelation of what God is doing and wants to do in and through us, then we become complacent as a church. And, and, you know, we come to worship on Sunday, but that's all we do. But if God says we're an army to bring the good news of salvation to the community about us, to, to take on the powers of darkness that would want to keep people in sin and hold them back, and, and, and God says, no, you're an army of righteousness to go forward. If, you are, if, 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 if he says that we... Um, have all that we need right now to be an effective light, to be a safe harbor in Bourne. And we don't see that, then we're not going to harness ourselves to God's vision. But the minute God says, this is what I have for you, this is who I've called you to be, this is where I want you to be, here's where you're going, here's the call that's upon you at, corporately as a church, and we say, okay. Let's get down to business. We can do this because God has called us to this. And then we don't cast off restraint. I look at the restraint as being more like a harness. If God puts a harness on our lives that we can pull with him, we can work in ministry with him. If we begin to get a picture of what God wants to do it in and through us, and we look at all these empty pews, not with discouraging eyes, but as opportunities to say, who's going to be sitting here, and who's going to be sitting here, and who's going to be sitting over here? People who don't know the Lord right now. People who are living lives uh, you know, of desperation. People who are wondering what is true and what is not true and, and, and putting their hope in everything but what can truly give life. And we have an opportunity of seeing lives changed before our very eyes. People that you may look at and you say, I don't think they'll ever come into a church. And you'll be surprised what God can do. How many people in the first century looked at Saul, the persecutor of the church, and, and understood that he was going to become the chief apostle to the Gentiles? Everyone's like, him? Of course not. But God has a vision. He has a revelation. And so, we're there, if we put this verse in a positive light, where there is a revelation of what God is doing, then the people will be willing to be harnessed to that vision and say, Lord, here I am. Use me. What do you want me to do? Of course, the verse ends, blessed is he who keeps the law. Now, we look at that, and from our American understanding, we say, okay, blessed is he who keeps the rules. That's not what it's saying. The word law in the Old Testament is the word Torah. Blessed is he who lives Torah. And Torah is a lifestyle. We would say someone who is walking with the Lord, someone who is on fire for Jesus. So the verse, if we were to kind of contemporize it, would be, you know, um, where there is no revelation of what God is doing in and through us, in our community, in our lives, in our church, people will cast off their straight. But blessed is he who is on fire for Jesus. That's what that means. It's not just, you know, okay, I'm keeping all the rules. No, when we're on fire for Jesus and we're harnessed in his vision, it's easy to walk in his way. We don't have any time to sin because we're just busy ministering for the Lord. What would your week look like if you know that throughout the week that several times you're going to be uh, uh, asked by coworkers or neighbors who would say, would you pray with me? I'm going through a hard time. And you get to pray. And when you pray, God begins to use you to touch their lives. He gives you a word of wisdom or knowledge, something you didn't know. And you say, 
I don't know if this means anything, but let me encourage you with this. And they go, how did you know that? I don't know. I think the Holy Spirit just told me. And it will change lives. God wants to use us in that way. And so, you know, look at that verse. Pray through that verse and say, God, what is the revelation that you have for us? God's vision is not what we hope will happen. So don't just simply look and say, oh, I get to write down everything I want to see happen through our church. <laughs> that may be our vision, but it's not necessarily God's. So vision, the revelation that we're talking about here is not just simply putting down our wish list. It's not telling God our big ideas. Now, I have great big ideas. Years ago, I had a whole lot of big ideas for the churches that we were pastoring. And, you know, someone said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. I think I made God laugh quite a bit because it just didn't come about. But there were some things in there, some things in there that I have not let go because I just really, really believe that God has given some aspects of revelation. Um, God's revelation gives us a course to run on. Um, I didn't use this as a scripture verse, but let's turn to Acts chapter 13. I want you to see um, just one example of, um, of how the vision can give us a course to run on. Verses 1 through 3. And this is um, the elders in the church of Antioch were praying. And uh, I'm going to start reading in verse 2. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed hands, their hands on them and sent them off. Two verses. Change the course of the world. Saul is the Apostle Paul. He changed his name from Saul, the Hebrew rendering, to the Greek rendering, Paul. But here the elders in the church of Antioch were fasting and worshiping and praying before the Lord. They didn't have an agenda except for the seeking God. In the midst of that, the Lord revealed to them that they were to commission Paul and Barnabas as missionaries to go out into, um, you know, um, Western Asia and eventually into Europe to bring the message of the gospel. And from those two verses, we have the rest of the book of Acts to follow. It's all about the ministry of Paul and Barnabas. But here's the point. Paul and Barnabas didn't say, ah, I think we're going to apply for this position. We're applying to be missionaries to to, you know, Europe. And the elders didn't say, well, let's look at their application. Let me see. Well, you know, Saul's a murderer. No, we're not taking him. As they were seeking the Lord, God revealed to them the call that he had upon both their lives. And the elders together said, we've heard God. And they went out. Now, if you look at the ministry of the Apostle Paul, he had many, many, many hardships in terms of bringing the gospel through three missionary journeys. I mean, he was, he was killed and raised from the dead. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. Look at 2 Corinthians, and you go through the litany, the list of all that he suffered. Why didn't he give up? Because he heard a word from God. Not only he, but the church that sent him out heard a word from God. And when we hear a word from God, when we know that God is calling us to do something, then even if the vision, even if the revelation will linger a little bit, we're saying we're pressing on because God is in this. Can you see how a vision can cause us to be harnessed for him? Think about Abraham. 
Abraham, because he heard from God, went from being a retiree at 75 to being the father of many nations. God spoke to him five times in 25 years. That's it. He didn't have a church. He didn't worship every single week. He didn't have the Bible. He had five times that God spoke to him, and on the basis of those five revealed words, Abraham's faith is legendary because he persevered. Even becoming a father at the age of 99 when his wife was her mid-90s. What about Gideon? Gideon, good old cowardly Gideon in the Bible, in the book of Judges. Gideon is hiding from the Midianites. He is complaining, you know, I have to thresh my wheat in private so they don't come and take it from me, those bullies. And God shows up to him and speaks a word to him and Gideon goes from being a coward to being the mighty man of God that delivers Israel because God spoke to him. He gave him a vision for what his future was like. Same thing is true with us. We need to seek God for his picture of our future. And when God gives a vision, it's always a promise Tied to a very vivid picture. So what's the promise? What's the picture? And, and I believe that God is going to clarify, bring greater uh, definition to the visions he's given in the past. That when we look at the history of our church, God's not saying, okay, about turn. You know, it's going to be consistent with everything that's happened in the past. And, and it's going to project us. It's going to propel us into the future with renewed vigor. Um, and, and I'm excited about what we're doing, so I just say, press in. You know, I entitled my message 2020 Vision because we need 2020 Vision. Nearsightedness means I only see what's in front of me, but I can't see anything that's far away. That's a problem with vision, right? We have to get corrections for that. If we're nearsighted, then we only look at the problems. We only look at the, the situations. We look and say, well, what are we going to do about this? And what are we going to do about this? And, and we get the tyranny of the urgent, but we can't see God because the problems are so big. You know, if you're standing in front of a tree, it looks big. But if you get a mile back, the tree looks small. Right? So nearsightedness, we need to be careful about that. We don't want to be nearsighted. We also don't want to be farsighted. Looking so far into the future that we're always preparing for the future, but we never do anything now. It's like a team that is always in the locker room planning out plays, but never goes out on the field. Always preparation, never on the field. We need 20-20 vision that says we can see the far, we can see the close, and we can see everything in right perspective with the word that God's speaking to us. So are you with me? Can we seek the Lord together? Can we pray? Can we believe that God will reveal things to us? That he's going to reveal things not just to the leadership team, but to every single one of us. And that together, there's going to be a mosaic. When we put it all together, we're going to see a mosaic of what God has for us. I'm excited about that. So, Let's seek the Lord. Let's ask him for his revelation, what he is doing. And let's share it. Let's talk about it. Now, there may be some things that you get and you go, well, I think it might be this. If you hear some things that are, you know, chaff, that's okay. It would have blown away. But there's going to be some wheat in that too. There's going to be a lot of things that I'm going to say that are probably going to be chaff. And you have the right to say, Pastor, I'm not certain that that's part of what God has to say. You need to say that, all right? But we do that with everybody. And I just, I am so excited about what God is doing right now. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Just thank you, Lord, for the presence of your spirit right now for the faith that you are stirring within our hearts. And we ask, Lord, that you would reveal your thoughts, 
your big ideas, your vision for our future, that you would reveal the promises that you have for us and the picture of where you want us to go and who you want us to be as we look forward. Lord, speak to us. Reveal yourself to us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for <clears throat> our benediction. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. However, as it is written, no, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him.